Hey guys, how you doing? I'm trying the new talking emoji option in Skype. Where, uh, you know, you pretend that you're like a teddy bear or something like that. It just puts a, an icon over your face. Um, anyway, uh, hopefully it looks pretty good. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, 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 software-based networking. I lied about the emoji. It was a mask. Hey, guys, and welcome to the show. I kind of wish you could see some of the stuff that we don't show you. But um, that aside, uh, sorry for the corny intro, but I, I just had to do it. It was it was fun while I was doing it, but I apologize. Um, anyway, with us today... We have Kyle Bisnett. Kyle is a senior premier field engineer and uh, one of my brethren because I used to be one of you guys. How you doing, Kyle? Hey, doing good, sir. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man, anytime. Listen, uh, we're always looking for people that, that know their stuff and that like to do this and that have fun doing it. So, so you guys might be seeing a lot of Kyle. <laughs> Hey, so tell us a little bit about what software-defined or software-based networking is. Yeah, absolutely. So software-defined networking really takes the, the static out of the equation of physical network devices, right? We can, really, we can be really agile with how we're changing our network functions and our, our network architecture, really. So when we talk about Microsoft SDN in particular, we really talk about a few key components, and that's um, network controller, which handles our network virtualization. And as you know, right, when we talk about encapsulation, we have something called VXLAN, and that encapsulates our packets for us. Uh, we also have built-in load balancers, and then we also have built-in gateways. So that way we can do a site-to-site -site connection, a GRE connection, or even maybe a layer three connection so we can access core resources on the corporate network. So does this only affect Azure-based networking? Uh, so this is actually for on-prem. We like to think of Microsoft SDN as, as the intelligent edge uh, because ideally most customers are going to be running in a hybrid scenario. So we want to be able to give them a way to connect to their intelligent edge. And in this case, it may be their data center up to the intelligent cloud, which would be Azure. Um, the real cool part about this is most of the components that are running on-prem are really Azure binaries that have been baked into Windows Server 2016 and 2019. Ah, so that's kind of neat. But customers will still have routers and switches. That is correct. Yeah, so Microsoft yeah. SDN, that's one of the things that we say to all of our customers is we really want to complement your existing environment. We're not saying, you know, go pull out your router and just use our routing device. We want to make sure we're being complementary for sure. Awesome. Cool. So uh, I understand you have some slides for us that you're going to walk us through that, that maybe makes this a little more understandable for people that are watching. Yes, for sure. I have about 14 or 15 slides. I didn't want to bore everybody with uh, PowerPoint decks. And then I have a quick demo that I want to hop into and kind of give you guys the lay of the land for SDN Express and help customers see how easy this is to really deploy. I love it. Here we go, guys. Let's do it. Kyle, tell us what we're looking at, bud. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, before we dive into software-defined networking, I really wanted to make sure for our customers, we kind of had an overview of what our Microsoft worldview looks like. And this is something that you guys will see presented, um, you know, at Ignite, at Build, for example. But when Satya talks about our Microsoft worldview, we really talk about Intelligent Edge and our Intelligent Cloud. And the idea is that most customers will be hybrid. And when we look at competitors, we have a very interesting edge there, no pun intended, our intelligent edge. And that's kind of where Microsoft Software Defined Networking fits in, is we like to think of the intelligent edge as the customer's data center. So being able to leverage Software Defined Networking to be able to sync up to their intelligent cloud, for example, is really where SDN fits in. So we'll kind of, you know, I just wanted to make sure everybody had a, uh, a rough overview of that, and then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and head into SDN now. Yeah, so hang on just a second. I have one question for you. One sure. of the things that that I think um, that that was always a question mark for customers was, hey, I'll build, I'll put servers in Azure. I'll, I'll do that. But then how do my guys get to Azure, right? How do, how do people on-prem 
actually get to the infrastructure that that I've created in Azure. And usually it was, well, you, you know, you create a VPN and exactly and you connect that VPN network to your network and just update your routers with some routes and, and away you go. It sounds like this solves some of that. Yes, for sure. It really does. I mean, the ability to create a VNet on premise without having to, uh, you know, get, um, have a VLAN configured, for example, and do it with a few mouse clicks is a beautiful thing. And then taking it another step and saying, now I'm going to connect that VNet up to my Azure subscription and be able to communicate with all of those virtual machines as well. And you know, the, the best part about SDN is you have your choice. So you could create a site-to-site -site connection from your VNet that's on-prem now. Um, and then something we won't talk about here, but maybe in another uh, another scenario is we also have our Azure Network Adapter that's coming out in Windows Server 2019, which will allow you to create a point-to-site tunnel automatically to your Azure subscription from on oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, right, absolutely. All right. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, you're fine. Yeah. All right, so you know when we talk about again Intelligent Edge, we talk a lot about a lot of different devices that can connect, and again, this is where SDN really fits in. So there's three different scenarios that this really helps us with. It helps us to deploy faster. Now, in a normal scenario, if we were a CSP and we were onboarding another tenant, we would need to go to our network team and say, hey, can you please provision a new VLAN? And you may have to provision some static routes, possibly. With SDN, you can do a few mouse clicks, and you basically have a software VLAN, or what we would call a routing domain ID. Um, again, you know, you can have really quick gateway connections, wh whether that's for a layer three or a site to site. And then you also have external and internal software load balancing, which is really just some Windows VMs running a certain set of rules. Uh, the beautiful thing about that piece is a lot of time our app owners have access to their virtual machines, but they may not have access to those load balancers. With this, we solve that equation to be able to say, hey, if you need load balancing, you can simply do it from a software perspective. Um, the second pillar is enhancing our network security. Another great feature of Microsoft SDN is a distributed firewall. And again, we're not saying to take all of your firewalls out that are within your data center. We want this to be complementary. So we're really adding another layer. And this distributed firewall is enforced within the vSwitch on each host. Um, again, it's a lot of those same binaries that we see in public Azure. So we're able to use network security groups for micro segmentation we're able to even architect network security groups on premise before we were to maybe move to a hybrid model or move everything to Azure. So it kind of level sets, what do we need in our front end tier? What do we need in our back end tier? And how are we going to protect those, you know, those rules? Um, and then that third item is really routing and mirroring to specialized virtual appliances. In all of my conversations that I have with customers, they'll say, well, we really want to do port mirroring inside of our virtual network, but we need to use this specific Linux appliance because it's been approved by the security teams. And with SDN, that's, that's fantastic. We can certainly do that. We can use something called user-defined routes and be able to route traffic to a Linux VM within that VNet, and then you can modify that traffic as you see fit and then send it outwards. So it's, it's a fantastic feature, and it's something that's been welcomed by a lot of customers that we've spoken with. And then the third is really reducing costs. I mean, we have the ability to converge RDMA, which in Windows Server 2012 R2, we could not utilize RDMA when a vSwitch was attached to those physical NICs. And now we can. We can leverage RDMA. We can even go as far as getting guest RDMA. Um, and for those of you that do not know, RDMA is really remote direct memory access. And we remove the processor and a lot of the NIC driver from that transaction. So it's very quick you know, it's lightning speed. We can get almost near line rate without having any type of uh, burden on the, on the line rate speeds. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, it's perfect. It really works out well. So again, those are really what SDN brings to the table from three different pillars. Let's talk a little bit about the components, though, because one of the feedbacks we've received from customers is, you know, I understand Microsoft SDN, but how does it break down into components? And this diagram is kind of short and sweet, right? Um, you know, most folks are using Virtual Machine Manager to manage their SDN environment. And then within VMM, we have three components, Network Controller, our Load Balancers, and our Gateways. And these are just Windows Virtual Machines that are running on the same hosts that your VM tenants are running on. And we'll, we'll dive into the functions of each one of those. 
Um, and then on all of our Hyper-V hosts, we have a Hyper-V switch, which is using our Azure virtual filtering platform. And that Azure VFP is actually the same binaries that are used on all of our hosts that sit in our Azure data centers. So you can truly say that you're running a smaller subset of Azure in your own data center, uh, albeit scaled down a little bit, right? Um, and then you also have these two host agents, our network controller host agent and our SLB host agent. So very simplistic deployment. Yeah, that's really cool. So when we talk about pillars of SDN, you know, we talked about the load balancers and network controller, but let's kind of talk about what those are. So network controller, I like to refer to as the heart of the system, right? That's, that's our policy checker. It ensures that everything is running properly. Um, back in the 2012 R2 days, when we had SDN version 1, uh, VMM was actually our source of truth. And when we came out with SDN version 2, we heard some feedback and they said, you know, it would be great if we could isolate this into its own kind of virtual appliance, similar to what some of our competitors do. And so that's our control plane. It's highly available using something called Service Fabric. And Service Fabric is a microservices architecture. It's kind of one of those self-healing, uh, self-repairing architectures. It's something that we talk a lot about as a company as getting to where, you know, we can have an application that's stood up on a, on a ring, if you will. And if one of those VMs goes down, everything kind of just functions as normal. And that's where monitoring comes into play, right? Because network controller can stay up, um, but, you know, you may have something that's down and not know about it until you receive a monitoring alert. Um, and where do we install that? We install that on three Windows virtual machines. There's nothing special about this. It's just three virtual machines on your existing cluster. So again, very simplistic. The second pillar is network virtualization. And again, this is kind of our policy engine for SDN. This is where I talked about that Azure VFP. Our Azure VFP really gives us the ability to have network virtualization. Now within that, one of the big features is that micro-segmentation distributed firewall. Again, that's another layer of protection from DDoS attacks, from somebody who can get in from a certain front door, but they can't technically technically get to your, you know, your back indoors. And that's installed on our Hyper-V hosts. And, you know, most of the time, if you're running SDN, you'll be using Hyper-V as your virtualization platform. Um, so, you know, it's, it's auto-installed within those Hyper-V hosts. Now, the third pillar is kind of where we transition a little bit from the heart of the system. That's how do we get out, right? Because we have a virtual network. We've encapsulated that traffic. Nothing can leave that network now, so it's isolated. But we need a way to get out. You know, if we need to access our corporate active directory, or maybe we want to create a VPN tunnel to our Azure environment, or even a GRE, that's where remoting, uh, remote and routing access would actually come in. Um, and, and again, that's simply on two Windows VMs. Um, we do have an M plus N redundancy, so we give you the ability to say which gateways are going to be active and which ones are going to be passive. Um, and then we also have our software load balancers. So our software load balancers are very comparable to our competitors' load balancers, except for the fact that you do not have to go to the rack and actually, you know, stack one of those large appliances and have to worry about the maintenance agreements and such. These are just Windows virtual machines, and they're very easy to scale out. Um, so that does provide layer three and layer four load balancing as, a, uh, as well as network address translation. Uh, network address translation gives us the ability to provide a outbound access for a VNet so we can get internet access. And one thing I want to call out is with both of these, a lot of customers will ask, well, how do we ensure high availability? Because I haven't heard you talk about a cluster. You know, you're not clustering these, uh, these virtual machines. And that is true. We actually use something called BGP, which is our border gateway protocol. And that will actually advertise the routes out, up to our top of rack switch. And in turn, it will remove the routes if for some reason that virtual machine goes down for patching or we have some type of an outage somewhere. So a lot of features that are built into this. And these features are available in Windows Server 2016. And there's even more features that are coming for Windows Server 2019. How long does it take before we figure out that a, a box has gone down, just out of curiosity? Do, is there a heartbeat that we wait for or listen for, or is it just that that machine hasn't made a, you know, a, a, a route update in a while? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there is a heartbeat. Uh, border gateway protocol by default will heartbeat. And once a certain subset of seconds have passed, it'll actually remove that route. Cool. Yep, absolutely. So this slide is a little um, overbearing, if you will. <laughs> this, uh, this shows all of the features that we have available within SDN. And I, I actually highlighted a few features that are new inside of 2019. I, I won't uh, you know, bore you guys with Power, PowerPoint boredom, if you will. Uh, but a few things that I do want to call out is uh, firewall logging and our virtual subnet encryption. For a lot of customers that have deployed SDN, they have said, you know, for PCI compliance or any other type of compliance uh, measures, we need to be able to encrypt that virtual network and we want to do it on the hosts. So that way we do not have to burden our network team with it. And we now have the ability to encrypt all of the traffic that's within that virtual subnet so that you can't run a packet sniffer on it, for example. Uh, it's a really great feature that a lot of customers have loved. Um, and then the second one is firewall logging. So I talked about micro-segmentation. Now we have the ability to actually use Power BI, and we can look at all of our firewall rules that we're hitting. And if we're hitting a certain number of denies, we can actually alert on that in Power BI to show our knock that we may have some type of malicious, malicious attack occurring. Wow. Yeah. So, 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 hey, guys, if you're watching this, pause the video, use snipping tool, grab the slide. That's the best way to do that. I'm sure we'll also include a link to it. But I want to ask you about something that you just said. What do you mean you can't run a packet sniffer? I live and die in packet sniffer. <laughs> yeah, so you can certainly stand up a virtual machine within your VNet, and you can attempt to sniff that traffic. But that traffic is actually secured with certificate-based authentication. Sure. And unless you have that yeah, certificate... The data, data is going to be encrypted. I don't care about that. If I'm troubleshooting a networking issue, really all I care about are the TCP headers. Exactly. Absolutely. And the great part about that is if your security team has, you know, blessed a particular Linux VM that you can use, you can go ahead and, that, and slide that into your VNet on-premise use some user-defined routes, and funnel all of the traffic to that port mirror device. Okay. There you go. Uh, absolutely. So I talked a lot about layer and security, right? Micro-segmentation is a big thing. That's a, that's a very large buzzword right now in our industry for on-prem, even as in Azure when we talk about network security uh, groups. So normally when a threat comes in, we'll have our physical network and we'll have what we call our, our physical appliances, right? So we may have some firewalls configured, we might have some ACLs, we'll have DDoS protection. And again, we want to complement that. Now the benefit to enabling software-defined networking is that you gain three more layers, technically four if you count the VM Windows firewall. You'll gain that virtual network isolation, which is really a routing domain ID you'll gain your network security groups and your distributed firewall isolation. And again, those are rules that you can go in and modify. It's based on five tuple, right? So if, and you can also do this for a particular VM network adapter, as well as an entire subnet that you've created. And as soon as you onboard a VM into that subnet, it'll take all of those existing rules because it's a distributed firewall. You have virtual appliances. Again, if you wanted to inject a router into your VNet that your security team has blessed, we could use those user-defined routes to inject a virtual appliance. And then a virtual machine firewall. Um, so one of the questions I get a lot from cloud service providers is, well, we enabled our VM firewall, and maybe we didn't set a group policy to keep it enabled or something. So the beauty about this is you can set those network security groups, and if your tenants go in, even if they're business units, right, and they disable that Windows firewall, all of those rules are still being enforced at the network security group. So there's really not much of a risk there, and you eliminate the risk as a CSP or as an enterprise. Yeah, that's so, cool. Yes, yeah, very neat. Um, now, with security, again, we, there, there's really three different scenarios. So we have micro-segmentation to segment our network based on app and security needs. Again, that's a five-tuple stateful distributed firewall that's in both directions. We can apply that to our virtual network adapter on an individual VM, or we can apply it to a subnet. And where the subnets really make sense is kind of following our Azure networking practice, is we have a back-end, a mid-tier, and a front-end. Maybe we only want our internet folks to be talking to our front end, 
And we do not want our front end to be able to talk to our back end directly, right? We need to go through our mid tier and then hit our back end. And that's exactly what micro segmentation gives us is the ability to set up those rules and ensure we're following proper security practices. Um, now, I will say this works for virtual machines and it also works for containers. We have a, uh, a script that can be used to implement SDN within our containers. As we know, containers are kind of a hot topic when we talk about DevOps these days. So, you know, that's fully within realm of our software-defined networking. Yeah, that's really cool. Absolutely. Uh, now, user-defined routes, those, like we talked about, those are used to route tenant traffic to our virtual appliances. Um, those are tenant-defined routing tables for virtual networks. And again, this is something you can do within an Azure VNet, too. Uh, you know, we have a lot of stuff out there in our marketplace. And if you wanted to use a particular uh, virtual appliance for all of your routing, you could create user-defined uh, routes within Azure. And now you can also do it on-premise. Um, again, the beauty of this is if a customer is looking to go to Azure or looking to go to a hybrid model, then you can test all of this uh, on premise. And then when you move to Azure, you kind of already have that blueprint laid out and ready to know that what you're doing on prem is going to work for you in Azure. Um, and then also just, you know, Keep note that the virtual appliance does not need to be aware of SDN. Uh, we support all virtual appliances as long as there's a version that's created for Hyper-V. That's really all our only requirement. And then the other item is port mirroring. And this kind of falls into user-defined routes. But again, uh, Lex, this, this is in your wheelhouse, right? Oh, you want to be able to see all that traffic. <laughs> Right. So port mirroring to mirror our tenant traffic, um, you know, this is pretty self-explanatory, but I will say that many ports to one appliance is possible. And keep in mind that that single appliance can serve those multiple ports. So you don't have to stand up one for each VNet. You could have a network adapter in each VNet and be able to use a single appliance, depending on the workload and how much you would be, you know, sniffing, for example. Uh, the other benefit to this is this appliance is not in the data path of VM to VM communication. So we do not modify those packets in any way. We simply send a subset of that traffic or a mirror of that traffic to that appliance. Yep. yep. Just like happens today on a, you know, on the back end of a switch. Exactly. And, and, you know, the best part about these port mirroring appliances is I remember back in the day, I used to be a CCNA, and I'm now an ex-CCNA, but I remember back in the day, you'd have to go hook up, you know, one of the big appliances in the data center and everything. Now, you know, within a virtual network, you can simply stand up a VM and you're good to go. So Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a data general luggable? I did not. <laughs> Although that does not sound like a fun have, time. Have you ever set up Lantastic with oh, Arch? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we've definitely evolved quite a bit, right? <laughs> so down. Oh, the Terminator must have fallen off again. That's right. It, it's always the network fault, right? <laughs> that's true, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, now, you know, kind of phasing out of the descriptions and such, we really have, and I, I love to talk about Windows Admin Center. Windows Admin Center is like the new thing to talk about right now. It's a hot item. Um, a Windows Admin Center, I wish it was, was around many, many years ago. Um, you know, when, when working with Hyper-V and failover clustering, there's so many different panes that you have to go to in order to see all of the information, whereas Windows Admin Center, you know, it's finally a website. You just hop over to it, connect to a host, and you can view everything you want about that host or even about that server. Um, so anyways, that was, that was my quick intro on Windows Admin Center. But you have two different options when it comes to managing software-defined networking. You have Virtual Machine Manager, which is really where a lot of our enterprise customers have gone, right? It, it's because it allows templating. It allows you to push out different port profiles and ensure that when you're building your architecture, it's built to the same practices across the board. It's very reliable and, you know, um, repeatable. So you have that option and you can deploy with Virtual Machine Manager. The best part is Product Group has made investments in both of these areas. We actually have an SDN Express script, which is a GUI interface, and it will walk you through each one of these deployments. Now, on the right-hand side, we have Windows Admin Center. And again, the beauty of Windows Admin Center, it, it actually has built-in monitoring on the website 
for all of our SDN architecture. So we can look at the health of our load balancers, we can look at the health of our uh, network controller environment, and we can even look at the health of our gateways. So some really good stuff that's coming for Windows Admin Center. Uh, some of the features have already been released in the, in the new version. We have a lot of other features that are planning to be released by end of this year slash uh, you know, Q3, Q4. And we're going to talk about those in the next slide as well. Okay. Uh, also, we do have that third party option, which is 5.9 Cloud Manager. They're a partner of ours. Um, 5.9 Cloud Manager kind of combines VMM and Windows Admin Center together, if you will. Uh, some customers have taken advantage of that, but you know, just know that you do have another option if for some reason VMM or Windows, Windows Admin Center does not work for your, your requirements. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and then also, I mentioned in 2019 we had some new features that were coming. So within Virtual Machine Manager, um, it, you know, back in the day when we were looking at encrypting subnets, there was some PowerShell that we had to do in order to do that. And we heard customer feedback, and now you can encrypt those subnets right from Virtual Machine Manager with a few clicks of a button. Um, we also have a Layer 3 uh, gateway connection that can take place in the UI. Um, again, that was very PowerShell driven before. So if you had a particular VNet and you wanted to go ahead and connect that back to, you know, say your core infrastructure, then you would have to use that PowerShell script. Now you'll be able to do that in the UI. Uh, we also have a floating IP for our software load balancers, which is great for when we're doing in-guest clustering. And we also have LLDP as well. Um, the one thing I'll call out here real quick is the floating IP, if you're planning to do SQL clusters within your virtual network, it's important to note that with this floating IP, it should be a very seamless experience. So, you know, just keep that in mind if you're planning to deploy any type of guest clustering. Yeah. Hey, so encrypted subnets. Explain to me what an encrypted subnet is. Is that just, are we just defining that anything that goes into or out of that subnet must be encrypted with IPsec? What's, what's an encrypted subnet? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah, so within an encrypted subnet, it's actually encrypted within the host environment, so within the vSwitches. And what we can basically say is maybe we have 10 tenants that have been onboarded to our SDN environment, right? And again, those are all segmented into uh, virtual networks, so they can't talk to each other. We can then take that virtual network and encrypt the traffic that's within it so that, you know, Basically, you can meet PCI compliance, and that's encrypted with a certificate thumbprint across all of the hosts. Um, and the beauty of that is you can have different virtual networks encrypted with different certificates. So we can meet a particular tenant's uh, request, for example. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great feature, especially when we talk about PCI compliance and such. That's a large requirement for our customers. So, And, and, and now it's easy to do thanks to Virtual Machine Manager. So within Windows Admin Center, again, you have, you have the option of Virtual Machine Manager and you have the option of Windows Admin Center. With Windows Admin Center, we have our SDN plugins in preview. Um, you know, they were just recently released inside of the new Windows Admin Center release. Um, now, we do have a few items that we have to be cautious of. They must be used with a hyper-converged cluster. So most of the time we see this when a customer is running Hyper-V, failover clustering, um, storage spaces direct, and then of course software-defined networking. So we do need to make sure it's an HCI cluster in order to use Windows Admin Center. Uh, we do have to deploy SDN using our SDN Express script, which in my demo I'll go ahead and walk you guys through that. Uh, network controller is the source of truth, so any type of changes that we plan to make, we're going to want to make those using our network controller PowerShell modules. And you also have the ability to have network controller PowerShell supplementing admin center. So I'll give you a use case for this. Right now, we cannot create load balancing rules within Windows Admin Center in the GUI. But the beauty of that is we can automate that and use runbooks using the network controller PowerShell module to do all of that work for us. So it's very scalable and easy to automate. So when we talk about the SDN roadmap, you know, right now we can do virtual networking, switching, routing, DHCP. Uh, we can do live migration. We can look at the infrastructure health. And then what's in end of year targeting is the ability to configure logical networks in our virtual gateways. Again, those layer three site-to-site -site or GRE gateways. 
we're going to have the ability to do ACLs or access control lists and then also our user defined routing so that way we can go ahead and plug in that port mirror device that you like Lex you know you won't have any uh, you won't have any problem with that and then uh, you know the future and beyond uh, we have load balancing health probes that will be supported we have network address translation quality of service, um, multi-rack, and our de full-on deployments using Windows Admin Center. Um, one of the cool features, and I kind of left this for last, we talked about 2019 features and that you want to take a snip of that slide. We do have VNet peering inside of SDN now. So it's very, again, like I mentioned, Azure binary is very similar. Uh, if you have two virtual networks that you need to peer with each other and have traffic talk between them, you can now do that on premise. So very neat stuff. All right, great. So I told you guys I wouldn't bore you with PowerPoint slides. So this is my last slide for right now. Um, Really, what we did, product group made a heavy investment into being able to deploy SDN easily. We heard a lot of feedback from customers for SDN version 2. So we, have, we now have something called SDN Express, which is a GUI-driven tutorial that will walk you through all of your different parameters that you'll need to successfully deploy SDN. Um, now, there's a few requirements that we need from our network team. Um, we will need a management VLAN, and we do need a provider VLAN, as well as our, you know, our subnet space. Um, those can be fully isolated from each other, uh, which means if you have different tenants on our provider network, they cannot talk to our management network, which may be where our CSP sits, for example. Now, some of those improvements is we have increased automation. We also validate those parameters. So we make sure that you're giving us the CIDR notation when you're getting ready to deploy. We have fewer prereq steps. Um, we do have that interactive UI, which I'm going to show you guys. And we also have PowerShell module for automation. So what that means is if you wanted to automate a lot of this process and you needed to deploy quick, for example, maybe you have multiple SDN environments and you need to be able to deploy host, muxes, and gateways quickly, you can use that PowerShell module to do so. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and hop into the demo and uh, check out SDN Express. All right, guys. So what I've done is I've actually downloaded everything for Software Defined Network is available on our GitHub page. And, and I'll make sure I work with uh, Lex to make sure we have that link published. Um, but what we've done here is we've downloaded everything from GitHub. And we have something called our SDN Express module. And I'm actually going to go ahead and kick that off. So I'm going to go ahead and do SDN Express. And you'll see a little bit of red there. That's fine. That's because I actually did not load our network controller module. And then you'll notice that you get a GUI in. So we see our SDN Express deployment wizard. Now, there's a few prereqs, and we called out those out within this wizard, right? So we have to allocate a block of static IP addresses from our management subnet. And those are what we're going to use for network controller, our MUXs, and our gateway VMs. We're also going to allocate a subnet and a VLAN for our Hyper-V network virtualization provider addresses. We'll allocate a set of subnets for our private VIPs, our public VIPs. Now, keep in mind, those private and public VIPs, those are going to be used for our load balancing, whether maybe we have an internal need for load balancing or we have an external need, maybe a SharePoint site that we need everybody within the company to access. And then we also have GRE VIPs that we need to make sure we have available. Um, those are not configured on a VLAN. So again, we make this simple. The only thing you need from your network administrator is really a VLAN and a subnet space for your management adapters, or your management subnet, I should say, and your HNVPA subnets. Uh, now, there is one requirement that we didn't talk about in the slides, and this is a, a good requirement to bring up here. We mentioned talking about using Border Gateway Protocol. Now, the way Border Gateway Protocol works is we have something called an autonomous system number, right? And that's, that's essentially what the Internet runs on. Um, and we need an ASN number for our top-of-rack router, and we also need one for SDN. And that's essentially how we advertise our routes and we learn about the other devices within ASN. Um, so SDN should peer with the loopback address of each one of our routers. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit next on this. Now, it's going to ask you for a VHD location. Ideally, we want to have a VHD already sysprepped ready to go, and we're going to go ahead and navigate out to that VHD. 
And we're going to go ahead and choose core because in today's world, right, we want to make sure we're staying safe and core is certainly a reduced footprint. So we'll make sure we uh, create a core image. And then we're going to go ahead and give a VM path on the host. Now, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say C and cluster storage one. In this lab environment, I'm actually running storage spaces direct. So I'm going to go ahead and place this onto my clustered storage. Now, a VM, VM name prefix is similar to what your customer naming or your company naming convention is or your customer if you're a CSP, right? So in this case, I'm just going to call this Fabricam. We love to use Fabricam and Contoso. Now we need the virtual and, machine and domain. We, and we have for 30 years. That, that's right, Lex. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and give our virtual machine domain, and this is the domain that our network controller, our MUXs, and our gateways are going to join to. And then we're going to go ahead and give our username, uh, because we are supporting bad practices here. We're going to use administrator, obviously, in a real-world deployment. You would not want to do this. We'll go ahead and type in our super secret password. And we're also going to type in our local admin password. Now, that local admin password is the local password that you've sysprepped within that VHD image, right? So two different passwords there. All right, so now we're on our management network. We're going to want to go ahead and input the VLAN ID that our network admin has given us for management. So we'll choose 215. We're also going to want to give a subnet prefix. So this is wrote in CIDR notation, right? So we're going to do 192.168 dot one dot two slash 24 ideally our best practices is to ensure you're doing a slash 24 block that ensures that as we grow we have enough space to grow as well we'll go ahead and give our gateway so in this case it's going to be oh, and look at that I actually messed up on this one so we're going to go back and fix this here so that should be zero and this should be dot one yeah and then our IP address pool is the pool that we want to start allocating to our network controller VMs, our MUX VMs, and our gateway VMs. So, you know, a good rule of practice is if this uh, subnet is pretty much free range, I usually do at dot ten. So I would start off at dot ten, and then I would usually end around whatever the amount of virtual machines I'm going to deploy. So, uh, you know, you can give it some space and do dot fifty, for example. Okay. And then also our DNS server. So that's going to be what server we're going to talk to for our DNS queries. And we'll go ahead and give this, um, let's go ahead and do 100.1, for example. And that doesn't have to be on the uh, uh, in this local subnet. That is correct, absolutely. Yep. Just pointing yep. that out. Yeah, most of the time that would be on our corporate network, for example. Right. Or 8.8.8.8. That's right. <laughs> Now, our next screen is our provider network. So again, this is where all of our encapsulated traffic is going to flow over, where all of our virtual tenants are going to be plugged into. So we'll go ahead and give a VLAN ID here of 215. And again, I'm, I'm just making these numbers up, but you know, make sure you chat with your network uh, administrator to ensure you're getting the right values there. So in here, I'm going to go ahead and do 2.1. And then our default gateway will be 2.1 for these. And then again, we'll follow the same practice, right? So dot 10, and we'll give it to about dot 50. Now, you'll notice this first MAC address and last MAC address. These are static MAC addresses that are going to be assigned from a pool. The benefit of SDN Express is it will auto-assign these MAC addresses you, for you. Do you know if we own that, that, that OUID? We do. We do. That is actually a Microsoft-owned. Yep. Absolutely, that's yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and just one other thing I'll call out. You'll notice within this UI that we have a hyperlink here for planning SDN. That's really beneficial. Um, you know, go check out that documentation, and we'll make sure we include that. Um, I'll make sure I get that over to Lex. Now, in this screen, we have the ability to say whether we want to do a multi-node network controller environment or a single node. A single node is fine for if you're doing some QA or testing, but in a production environment, we need to ensure we have at least three network controller VMs. And we're going to go ahead and give that a REST name, right? So this is the, this is the FQDN that we'll communicate with network controller on. So normally how I do this is I'll usually do nco1.fabricam.com. 
And then we'll go ahead and list out our current Hyper-V hosts that we want to place into this SDN um, ecosystem. So we'll go ahead and do Hyper-V1, Hyper-V2, and Hyper-V3. And then we also need to provide our host credentials and our super secret password. That's more secure than our secret password in case that, you're wondering. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, now we're at our software load balancers. So again, the beauty of this is if we go back to load balancing, remember if you want to add a physical load balancer, it's the whole rack and stack deal. Here we can actually have up to eight load balancers within our pool. And if we need to scale out, we can simply use this slider to continue scaling out our load balancers to meet demand. And how we generally see if the load balancers are starting to max out is by analyzing memory and also CPU. If we start to approach certain limits there, we can go ahead and increase this. Now the two subnets that we're gonna give are our private VIP subnets and again, Keep in mind that this is for, uh, you do not need VLANs for these. This is just for load balancing. So we'll go ahead and give six. All right, and then we're on to our gateways. And again, our gateways, we can easily scale these out. And again, to, you know, to monitor these, we would be checking CPU and memory. So we can have up to eight gateways within a single pool and we can have a certain amount of gateways on standby. So gateways on standby really means that when we have multiple site-to-site -site connections on a particular gateway and that one has a failure, we'll actually light up the other gateway VM that's on standby and re-terminate all of those connections automatically. And then we'll also inform the top of rack switch that, hey, you know, we've had a gateway failure, but this is our new active gateway. So we also need to... Sorry, go ahead, Lex. Yeah, I was just going to say that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's very neat. I, the ability to scale this out so quickly is a, an awesome feature. We've, we've heard some great feedback from our customers on this. So I'm going to go ahead and give a GRE endpoint. And this is if you were terminating GRE tunnels, right? So if you were terminating a GRE tunnel, we would be using this subnet to do so. Um, and, and keep in mind, we do not have to configure a VLAN for this one. It's just an endpoint. So we'll go ahead and give an endpoint of 23. Oh. And then we get to the border gateway fund. So the border gateway protocol, we're gonna go ahead and assign an ASN number to our SDN environment. And we're gonna just go ahead and assign 8400 for now. We're gonna go ahead and give our router an IP address. And in this case, I'm just gonna give it dot one for simplistic example. And we're going to give our router ASN number. So we're going to go ahead and call this 8405. And you do have the option to assign another router, right? So we can, in a normal architecture scenario, you would have two top rack switches that may belong to a different ASN. So you have that ability to peer with multiple ASN numbers at the top of rack. So once we've done that, we're ready to deploy. Uh, we would simply hit the deploy button. I actually have a lab environment that's already deployed, so I'm not going to do that. It would it would actually wipe my entire lab environment. Um, but we also have an export button, and that export button is awesome in a sense that you can actually keep track of what you've created, and it will give you a full file of all of your parameters, and you can reuse this as you need to scale out the existing environment. So, you know, I always tell people, make sure you place this in a uh, digital safety deposit box somewhere, right, and make sure you have, uh, you know, track of it. Wow, that was awesome. Hey, uh, uh, Kyle, one of the things that you just mentioned was that you do have a, uh, uh, this this built out in, in a virtual environment um, in a lab. Uh, I'd love to see that. Um, let's do that. Uh, let's do a part two. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on board for sure. Uh, I'd love to walk you guys through the live demo environment. We'll talk about the uh, load balancers and even see some tenant VMs being created. Yeah, I think that would really be worthwhile because I think that, um, you know, a lot of this stuff makes sense to me. I'm a networking guy. We've probably got folks out there that aren't networking people that are kind of interested in this. And I think doing a part two where we actually show the how this works in real life and the problems that it solves and, 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 you know, talk about maybe why, why this is helpful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm fully on board. Would love to do another episode. 
All right. Awesome. So I guess that's our next episode, folks. Um, listen, uh, thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, we certainly uh, appreciate it, and this has been very interesting. Hey, thank you, sir. I appreciate the time and for allowing me to come on the show. Thank you very much. Yep. And guys, there you have it. That's your taste of premiere.